Hi, Glennis. Hey, Aaron. What do you want to talk about today? How much I f- hate diets. <laughs> yeah, diets suck. <laughs> so what do you do instead of a diet? Intuitive eating. Health at every size. So how many times have you had to explain intuitive eating and health at every size to someone? Like 5,000 times. But and- that was just to my doctor. <laughs> Okay, so how many times have you explained it to someone and then they said, but diets are the only thing I know? That's like every time. Can we pursue health without thinking about weight? Yes, we can pursue health without thinking about weight. That's pretty revolutionary what you just said. But what if you just don't like yourself at the size that you're at? I think we need to understand why instead of just saying I need to change. So, what's the deal with body positivity? Oh man, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Aaron Flores. And I'm Glennis Oyston. And we are Dietitians, Dietitians Unplugged. Unplugged. <laughs> Glennis, here we are back again in our Dietitians Unplugged studio, still to be waiting a sponsorship. So if you want to name our virtual studio, drop us some dimes, we'll do it. <laughs> yeah, we should put a price tag on that, right? Probably more than a couple dimes. Yeah, a few, quite a few dimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quite a few dimes, eh? Yes, yes. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, man, awesome. Uh, I am really excited for today's episode. I think this is um, this is one of those I think people are going to remember for a long time. Uh, I think this is one where we sort of bring the really human side to struggling with binge eating disorder and living with binge eating disorder and being in a larger body uh, and and a lot of vulnerability, especially from someone who's sort of been in the community as a, you know, sort of prominent key fixture uh, that people look up to. So I, I think this is going to be a great episode. People are going to really enjoy it. Yeah. We're talking to Sunny Seagold today, aside from having hands down, the coolest name I've ever heard in my life. Um, (laughs) Sunny is somebody who has had a binge or has binge eating disorder, um, went through recovery that she'll tell us about and then, and then relapsed. And she suggested talking to us about this. And I'm so glad because this is a conversation I'm having constantly with clients, um, especially my binge eating disorder clients who are in larger bodies. And they say to me, like, when do I get to try and lose weight again? And I talk a lot about, well, what happened when you tried to lose weight before, right? And it's hard to connect the past with the present and and if there was a causal relationship there or what the correlation is between their past dieting and their binge eating disorder. And I think that really what it just needs is a story, right? Somebody just telling their story about what happened yeah. for them because her experience is exactly what some of my clients have experienced. When she was talking about it, I was astounded. It was like, oh, is this you know, is this this person that's telling me about this, you know, that I know so well. And um, so I think that while it's her story, it's also a fairly universal story to binge eating and binge eating recovery. So I was really happy to have her come and talk about it. Absolutely. And and I think, again, the way she explains her her lived experience, I think so many people are just going to be like, wow, that's that sounds so much like what I'm doing, what I'm struggling with also. So I'm really appreciative of that. Yeah. So let me just read her bio. Sunny Seagold is a longtime health journalist and former magazine editor who is in recovery from binge eating disorder. She wrote a book for young women who binge eat called Food, the Good Girl's Drug that came out in 2011. If you want to keep up with her, follow her on Instagram at Sunny Seagold, where she shares about binge eating and body acceptance. All right. So without further ado, here is our interview with Sunny Gold. Welcome to the show. Um, I'm really happy to have you here. We both are happy to have you here. Super excited. Yes. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I know uh, we've been trying to arrange a time for a while. So um, if you hear me sniffle or cough a little bit, I'm I'm coming down with a cold. So, And we are so appreciative of you being here despite that. Um, And also really appreciative um, of your willingness to talk about the thing we're going to talk about today, which is your relapse 
with your binge eating disorder. And I was really happy that you actually brought this up as a topic. But before we get into that part, can you tell us just a little bit about your background with having been diagnosed with BED and and what recovery was like back then for you? Sure, sure. So um, like a lot of people with eating issues of any kind, um, mine started back in childhood. And um, as I was coming up, I was a teenager in the 90s and I realized something was very wrong with the way I interacted with food, you know, sneaking it and eating these large amounts and feeling out of control and not understanding what was going on. So um, I, my mom got me set up with uh, just a couple of sessions with her therapist who was a pastor and like a, a, you know, a licensed counselor. You know, that was, I think BED was in the uh, DSM, maybe in like an appendix or something or mentioned in a footnote at that point. Um, but it wasn't really something anybody talked about. So he, he told me to read some Janine Roth books, which I did. He said it was called... Um, emotional eating or compulsive overeating. And so I felt, you know, a little better just knowing, oh, I'm not the only, I'm not the only one here. But at the same time, you know, I was, I was only 16 and I'm reading these Janine Roth books and they were beautiful, but they were all about like, to me at the time, all about these old ladies (laughs) with, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with this eating problems and oh my God, and their kids and like, oh, they're talking about their husbands and all this. And I'm just trying to like go to prom and, you know, be normal. So I, I had a little bit of shame too around the fact that, you know, I thought I had like an, an old lady disease (laughs) or an old lady issue. Um, but fast forward, (laughs) um, In my 20s, I started talk therapy for mostly for depression. It was after September 11th and I I lived in New York City at the time. And through that, started addressing my my, um, relationship with food as well. And I never really lived in a really large body. Um, So it wasn't necessarily something you could see from the outside. I mean like a lot of binge eaters, I also dieted almost constantly. So, you know, it didn't really show up too obviously on the outside. Um, But I did do just regular sort of talk therapy for uh, a few years. And that helped me get some of the depression. And also I I got help for depression um, as well, medication. I realized... Just just a, a couple of years before I was about to turn 30, that I still, you know, it was like I, I, I was right up to the edge of recovery, mm. but I, I just, I kept doing the behavior less than I used to, you know, not as bad as I used to, whatever, but I wasn't recovered and I wasn't sure what to do. I had never heard of binge eating disorder yet still. Um, and so I found a 12 step program. Um, and through going to that, I heard about, you know, binge eating, um, heard people talking about binge eating disorder and other eating disorders. At the time I was also working as a health journalist, a writer, uh, at Glamour magazine. And so, you know, I had the skills to like put on my reporter hat and (laughs) dug in and I'm like, what the F? Like, this is out there. This has been in the literature, you Mm -hmm. know, no one's talking about it. What, what is going on? This is exactly what I have. Um, so at that point I basically brought that to my therapist and was like, here's what I've got. Um, but I still didn't seek eating disorder specific um, therapy. At that point, the talk therapy and the 12 step support and structure, um, along with, I had quit dieting completely. So that was no longer part of the picture at all. Um, I also had, I was very regularly exercising, I would say four days a week with gentle exercise, Pilates, 
mostly. Um, I had consistent support with at least one support group meeting a week. I had a weekly therapy session and I was meditating every morning. Um, So with that structure, I recovered and was no longer um, binge eating or even even emotionally overeating. Um, Yeah, so... (laughs) I, I considered myself fully recovered after, I don't know, a year or two of that. And um, at that point, I got kind of pissed off because there still was not a book or resource out there mm. for a young woman, a young person with these issues. It was still, you know, aimed at... Um, I don't know. I mean, at 28, you're an adult, but really, like, are you? (laughs) (laughs) No. Yeah, exactly. A lot of us aren't. And so um, I had got this fire under my, under my bottom to, to put the, put something out in the world for that, you know, struggling college student that I was. Um, And yeah, you know, uh, from, from working at the magazine and, um, you know, having been trained as a journalist and all of that, I was able to write a book, um, basically about my recovery, but it's less a memoir than, um, than kind of an explainer Mm -hmm. of why this stuff happens. Um, and so there was a lot of research and I interviewed a lot of experts, Cindy Bulick, um, mm-hmm. for instance, and, and yeah, so that book came out in 2011 and, um, I had a good eight years with no binge eating and no emotional overeating to speak of. Um, I, I'm just going, you yeah. guys feel free yeah. to interrupt me. <laughs> <laughs> want to hear your story. No, this is great. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So um, I had been warned. So during this time, as my eyes were open, like, oh, binge eating disorder, it's a thing. Okay. You know, I was getting sort of involved with Vita and met um, Chavise Turner, the um, president and CEO Mm -hmm. of of Vita, which is now, of course, part of the National Eating Disorders Association. Mm -hmm. But then it was separate and it was sort of new. And, um, I, you know, started learning more and more and, um, I, you know, everyone kind of warned me, not, it's not that they were saying, oh, be careful, you know, you're not as recovered as you think. They were trying, I think that what they saw was a very confident young recovered person. Yeah. (laughs) And they were trying to say, um, hey, so... Recovery is a winding road. And don't be surprised if the binge eating pops up again for yeah. you at yeah. some point. Yeah. And I, I believed them, you know, in an abstract way. Um, but, you know, I, another person told me um, that her binge eating had resurfaced when she was pregnant. And so when I got pregnant with my first child, um, I thought, okay, well, if it's going to come back, this is the time. Mm-hmm. And it didn't. I, um, I weathered that pregnancy just fine. And the postpartum, and I was a little worried about oh, postpartum depression or something because of my history of depression. But um, that, didn't, that didn't happen. I do have one question. You discovered your binge eating disorder early on in like in your teens, right? Yes. I discovered, yeah, I didn't know what it was called, but yes. Had you ever dieted before that or was that? Oh, geez. Are you kidding? (laughs) I dieted like, (laughs) I mean, that's a great question, but yes, absolutely. 100%. What age did that start for you? Um, Officially around nine. Um. So like a lot of, like a lot of people that I have since had the honor to talk to who've gone through this stuff, you know, there was a lot of, uh, fat fear 
in my family. I grew up in my my mother was um, she wasn't a swimsuit model for her job, but she did model swimsuits, mm. and um, her her mother was like, uh, oh, what do you call those? Those bathing beauties who swam in like the yeah. movies oh, yeah. and yeah. did all that stuff. So, needless to say, I came from this long line of women who were. Southern California, live, long, and beautiful. And my dad's side of the family is more, I mean, I saw a picture of all my aunts and uncles all together the other day. There's a bunch of them. And all the women are either fat or round in some capacity. All of them. There's like four four aunts. Um, and so I, I was... I was just me, but my mom did not recognize my body type. She thought, oh, this girl's going to get fat. And that for her meant this girl's not going to get love. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I better jump in and I better help. Which is what a lot of parents do think. It's not to, you know, we're not assigning blame. That's just sort of the culture, right? Like exactly. trying to save you from exactly. this you know, this lack of love. This fate <laughs> right. to, to end all right. fate. This like, yeah. you know, a world ending. But I mean, for her, it really was because for her, you know, the way she grew up, her appearance really was sort of the only thing that she got um, validated for. And so, you know, I mean, appearance was a huge value of hers and for her, appearance meant not just a pretty face, but also a thin mm-hmm. body. And so, yeah. So there's a lot of pressure around that. So much value there, right? Yeah. yeah I feel yeah. like you're describing my own mother right now, right? Right. But, oh, yeah. She, she somehow was able to not push those values on me, not the body. Some of them, it was like half and half, but definitely just the way you're yeah. describing it. It's like, oh, this is how so many women lived, oh. you know? So many of us. And I think, you know, in part, the, I don't know if, I assume you and I are probably in the same generation. So my mom's a baby boomer and, you know, they were taught, I mean, when Helen Helen Gurley Brown's book came out, like uh, Sex and the Single Girl, she advocated, I think it was in in the 50s, she advocated eating one egg for breakfast, <laughs> an egg for lunch, and a steak for dinner, which is basically the keto yeah. oh my diet. God. You just described like the egg <laughs> diet, which my mom was on in the 70s. And she kept saying, I'm on well, egg diet. I'm like, don't know what that is. <laughs> don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. six. Don't know what that is. <laughs> exactly. Now I know what it is. Yeah. Thank and you, Ellen Gurley Brown. Right. It's the Helen Gurley Brown diet. Um, so yeah, so we all grew up in, in that soup. Um, and, you know, so... It's interesting though, because I, you know, looking back and I hear this again, I've heard this story come out of like so many other people's mouths. Looking back, I was never a, a an especially large child. Um, it's just that my, I just had a, like, I don't know, little muscular, like spark plug body and she was worried I was going to get yeah. fat. And what do you know? I did. and. <laughs> part of it, yeah. Part of it, you know, you have to wonder is the, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Well, if you look at family photos, I was probably always going to get be a bigger person. Mm. But would I have lived in this large of a body if I hadn't ever died? If if I didn't start counting calories at age right. nine, which then you know, led into feeling deprived and binge eating and the yo-yo diet cycle, the binge and restrict cycle. And what we know about kids who are restricted in childhood, they tend to be in larger bodies over time. So, you know, we don't know how much much that contributes. Well, and it's so funny because I feel like, so now I'm a mom of two girls and my oldest is seven and a half. And she looks just like I did when I was a kid at that age. So, Watching her, you know, I just, uh, and she's her own person. She's going to do her own things. She's her unique DNA, all of that. But I wonder, 
what her experience is going to be with her body because um, while she has, you know, some of my DNA and you can see it on her walking around, she's not going to grow up with the, the fat hate or the fat worry um, and the, the, the importance of appearance, you know? I mean, looking back, like, oh my gosh, my mom would compliment me by saying, you're the prettiest girl in your class. Oh, yes. <laughs> I would never. This, Are you it's such a weird me? thing to say, right? <laughs> it's so weird. Like, A, why? So what? B, are you are you sure? Because like, that's right. not. <laughs> and that was always my, my question. Is like, I'm pretty sure my mom has not met all the girls in the class and they are getting a lot of attention and I'm not. So I don't, you know, I don't think she's right on this. I'm 10, but right. yeah. Even so just the like comparing right. one girl or one woman oh, against so the other, awful. like that idea is so yeah. weird. But awesome. anyway, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So exactly. you're feeling pretty secure in your recovery. You were pregnant. You like, this didn't, you weren't relapsing at this point. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, but you did relapse. Yeah. I did. How did that yeah. go? So, um, you know, there's a lot of things I think that played, that played into it. One is um, I, the first time I recovered, I um, was single. I mean, I was dating my husband at the time, but I was single. I had, you know, so much freedom, so much time to put into my recovery um, and to going to Pilates, all the, you know, and this extra income that didn't have to go to like my child. <laughs> um, and so <clears throat> we ha- went through, my husband and I went through a few very stressful situations, a cross country move, a job change. Um, then we, you know, we had our toddler at the time. Um, I got pregnant with our second um, and we bought and sold a house. So all of this was happening um, right around the time that I got pregnant with our second. And that pregnancy was pretty unpleasant. Like uh, I didn't have, you know, sickness to the point where I had to be hospitalized, but I had morning sickness throughout the whole thing. And um, so the only food that I really could stomach was really uh, basically like the rice diet, right? Like, you know, uh, whatever, bread, simple carbs, ice cream. I couldn't stand much of anything. And so with with my second baby, the binge eating started, actually it wasn't even, I wouldn't even characterize it as binge eating, more um, emotional comfort eating started while I was pregnant um, because I, I felt so ill. I comforted myself the way I mm-hmm. used to before recovery, you know, with extra yeah. food. And um, so after I had her, I was heavier. Um, and and I, I have, I gained a ton of weight when I'm pregnant, which like didn't really... I wasn't really too bothered about it and neither were my doctors. Um, But somehow something, something about the second time, I just thought "Mm, that my body is too big. This is too big. I don't, I don't like this. So I don't remember having like really like body hate or anything that terrible, but I thought, okay, I don't like the size of my body right now, so I'll change it. And I really didn't even think twice. I thought, I have so much recovery behind me. I didn't relapse after the first pregnancy. I'm normal. I'm normal. And normal people uh, go on diets to lose Mm -hmm. the baby weight. So I did. And um, it didn't work. <laughs> oh, Fast really? forward, right? <laughs> so <laughs> surprising. <laughs> oh, Sorry, oh, that was terrible sarcasm. Yeah, so. But you found it once again, right? No, no. <laughs> yes. I mean, but I just like, 
I don't know. Like you see it work yeah. for other people. Yeah. And I just thought like I've been, I have felt, I had felt so normal for so long at that point, you know, eight years pretty much that I just thought I'm just going to do what a quote unquote normal person does. And so, um, yeah, so I went on, I don't even know what diet, it was probably like I, the blah I, blah I never, diet. It doesn't matter, right? I didn't do anything yeah. crazy, but yeah, it was it was one of the quote unquote reasonable ones, like Weight Watchers or South Beach or something. And um, you know, it was just this exactly how I remembered. You're you're you are quote unquote good for a week, maybe yeah. if you're lucky, <laughs> um, and then you then you yeah. fall off the wagon. Um, I went on six diets. In six diets over, I don't know, like a year and mm-hmm. a half, maybe. And by the time though I did all of those diets, I had gained a lot of weight and I had started binge eating again. Wow. Yeah. You know, so I just want to like pause for a second as you're going, because I think I think what's so important about this, like what you're sharing with us. And and working with you know so, you know so many clients who struggle with binge eating disorder is this is that um, they're always asking like what what is this process once I'm done with treatment or once I'm done seeing you what is this going to look like down the road yeah. uh, and I think the fact that you're able to sort of bring this honesty to the conversation I think is really important for people who are out there struggling today you know because I think the you know, this word recovery, I sort of, I have personal issues with. I don't, I don't know if I like it that much uh, because it like, it holds so much, again, value. Am I recovered? Am I recovering? Am I, am I relapsing? Whatever, you know, but I, I I just think I want to bring that human, like what you're bringing is the human experience to this. And I think no one talks about that human experience. And so, you know, I I just really want to honor this part of the conversation because I think it's really important for our listeners to know that um, it it's it's hard <laughs> and it and it stays hard at different times and it creeps up and in um, and so I, I just you know I don't, I wanted to just say that before we went too much further that there's a lot of courage in this conversation and I I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, thank you. I appreciate that too. And it is you know looking back now, I can I can right. connect the dots <laughs> and I can see. <laughs> what what was going on? I can see that I um, I was making some assumptions about about where I was with my um, mental health and just with my relationship with food and my body, and I can see that I deprived myself over and over and over, and basically kick started the binge and restrict Mm. cycle again. Um, And that might sound, I'm not judging myself for it. Um, I I was maybe like, I don't know, four months ago, five months ago, if we had talked then, um, I was, I was in this place where like, how could I be so Mm. stupid? How could I, how could I like walk around blind and just fall into yeah. a binge hole. That's kind of how it felt. And also, you know, being a person that <clears throat> I wrote a mm-hmm. book about this stuff. Like feeling like I should be even though even in writing the book I never put myself forward as an expert. It was always just like, hey, I'm a person who has been through this. Here's what I've learned. Here's the resources that I found, you know go in and do your thing. And I hope I can give you a little bit of hope. Um, But you still feel like, oh, well, I'm this person who wrote about my recovery and how well I'm doing. And, you know, people were coming to me, asking me for help and advice. And here I am binge eating again and trying to change my body feeling confused and locked in a crazy cycle I didn't feel like I could get out of. And so what I had to do first was kind of get over the 
bashing of myself for quote unquote, Mm -hmm. letting this happen again. Yeah. You know, like the thing that the, the, the thought that was, that was omnipresent at the time was I should know better. I should know better. Why don't I use my tools? I should know better. But in the face of a literal lifelong Mm -hmm. coping mechanism, add to that the biological restricting I was doing. Honestly, it's like, of course. Yeah. (laughs) Of course I was binge eating. But and one, one thing I want to say too is that you're you're not the only person that this is happening to, right? So like, and this is what right. I try to tell my clients because they say things like, well, I just don't know if I'm ever going to be okay with my body. And, um, and I say, you know, maybe, maybe that's true. I mean, we hope that you can get to a place mm-hmm. where you can live with it. Um, but people, even recovered people, even someone like me can be triggered at some yeah. point by this cultural imperative that we somehow be smaller. So your you're definitely, oh gosh, your experience yes. is, and that's why I'm so glad you're talking about it. I think your experience is just so universal universal in in so many ways is that, you know, we're still susceptible after quote unquote recovery. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, even now, so I, um, after trying to sort of uh, therapy and self help myself out of the binge eating cycle. So I stopped um, about two years ago, I stopped, I stopped trying to lose weight at all. I put the dieting down. I was like, okay, not doing that. That has not been working. This is insane. <laughs> um, and I finally, <clears throat> last year, looked into a, a DBT program here in Portland where I live. And I got on the waiting list. Now, I was on that waiting list for eight months. Eight months. I mean, this experience has made me so much more able to understand the struggles that people go through to find the help yeah. that is really going to help them. Um, I mean, I, I can't believe how long I had to wait. And there's, it's one of only two programs like it in Portland. The other thing is, is the last time I recovered, I was living in New York City where there's literally yeah. a psychiatrist on every corner. And I had a full-time job with excellent health benefits. Now I'm self-employed with a family <laughs> and I live in a smaller, mm-hmm. a smaller city. And the resources just are not the same. I also am, for the first time in my adult life, living in a fat body. And... I, you know, I always would had empathy for people in large bodies and, oh God, you know, I, I, I know how you feel and, um, but I didn't, mm-hmm. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, you know, and, and, um, I would also sort of sit in quiet judgment of someone who, let's say, opted for bariatric surgery or some of these, you know, medical options and I realize now, not one of us can sit back and make a judgment about someone else's experience in their own body. I mean, it, it, we all have mm-hmm. such different individual histories with ourselves. Um, you know, it's, it's a different situation. I mean, I, I was talking to my mother the other day about this, which was, difficult. She, she was telling me that she feels like I have opened her eyes a lot and taught her how unimportant body size is in Mm -hmm. terms of somebody's value. Um, and she accepts me uh, who I am. She, she doesn't ever talk about things like weight loss or, or diet. She doesn't encourage me to do anything like that. You know, when I told her we were FaceTiming and when I told her like 
yeah, mom. I mean, I, I don't know if I'm ever going to change my body, my body size. Like now that I am, have given up the idea that I'm going to actively try to change it and just heal myself and my relationship with food and try to eat more mindfully and intuitively and use tools so that I'm not binge eating, you know, that stuff requires that I pull back and let my body do its own thing. And a look crossed her face like, I don't know, like I think, you know, and again, I'm making assumptions here, but mm. she looked pained. And I, I think that she thought, just like I did, that, well, when you get better, when you get the binging under control, then you can, quote unquote, normalize yeah. your body size again. And the thing is, is my body is the size it is for a very good reason. This was caused. It didn't just happen overnight. Mm -hmm. I, this has been a four-year process. You know, my, my youngest is turning five next month. You know, it's not like I just woke up. I just woke up in this body. It is difficult for me to sit here and accept that I don't have control over, over it. That like letting go of the idea that I can control my body size is really hard. Yeah, and I think it's something that so many people are going to identify with, right? I mean, I really, I think it's, you know, one of, I think there's grieving through all of this, right? And 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 there's um, a lot of emotions that come up and, and having that piece of acceptance, uh, a lot of people struggle with that. And I think, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting how you're sort of talking about this, you know, sort of observance of how you see your mother's reaction to it, you know, and how that, you know, as someone who, mm -hmm. at least from her, her history, right, of having value on weight and what that means and like connecting those dots. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. there's a lot there. And I think, again, why this is so important is because if this is the human experience of, you know, being in a larger body, of struggling with an eating disorder that a lot of people don't understand. Um, and, and, putting a human right. experience to the, like what that process really does look like. And so it's a, it's a, it's a narrative that needs to be out here a lot. Well, the grieving, I'm glad you said that word because grieving is a lot of what I have been doing for the last several weeks, actually. And I'm still in that process because you know, in, in, in the DBT program that I'm in, it's a six month program. And, you know, for the first couple months, you know, we're really focusing on the behaviors and building structure and, and, and learning new tools to interrupt that behavior and cope in different ways. And now I'm into the like acceptance and emotion part of it where I thought the first part was mm -hmm. hard. This is so much harder because it's the real, it's, it's standing here looking forward into life without the, the false narrative. Yeah. And, and I wonder if it feels, I know some of my clients have said it feels like giving up, um, which feels painful to them. And I'm yeah. trying to see if it could be reframed as you're letting yourself be. Yeah. I mean, for me, it doesn't feel like giving up because I think I have done so much work around this um, in my life that I, you know, I know that the internal emotional work is so hard that if anyone if anyone would come at me trying to say you're right. not trying hard enough, yeah, that's that's I not happening, them. right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like, don't tell me, <laughs> yeah, don't tell me I'm giving up. Like, that is a whole big pile. Yeah, yeah. But in in terms of yeah, in terms of the body size, sort of controlling that, they definitely have mentioned like that feels like giving up. Yes, um, which is hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I can see how someone would would feel that way. 
I mean, for me, it feels more like um, the loss of of a like an ideal little dream out there that has been out there my whole life. Like, if you do this, you can. Your body will do this. And the first time I recovered, my body kind of did do that. It's like I know it doesn't happen for everyone, mm-hmm. but I was. I was young. I wasn't in um, that big of a body to begin with. You know, my body did um, shrink. So I still had that idea of, of what could happen to my body. And having to give that up is so painful. So painful. It's like I don't have, you know, when, in, when you're in diet mind, it's like the same thing of a diet mindset. It's totally the same. It's like when you're in that diet mind and you can just picture oh, what it'll be like when. It's like somebody takes that away from you. And so you're just mm-hmm. in the present. And you're not able to take yourself out by daydreaming about what could be. Because yeah, that exactly, longing. Yeah. Because you're here. Yeah. And I think one of the one of the problems is when we talk about lived experience, many of my clients say, well, I did control my body at one point. Um, So why can't I just do that again once I am not binging anymore? And I'm always trying to connect that, well, what was the other part of that experience? Oh, I was restricting. I started to binge. You know, my body returned to the weight it wanted to be. They 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 right. focus on the first part of the experience, which was I initially controlled it, which is of course why dieting is so seductive. Um, but it yeah. sounds like what what would you say to somebody who sort of is is having that that feeling? Oh, I would say I know, I know, I feel you, and I thought the exact same thing, and it just wasn't true. It wasn't true for me. And again, I'm, I'm careful in that I don't want to say what's going to happen for anybody else. But for me, and I think mm-hmm. probably for all of your clients, <laughs> it just hasn't, mm-hmm. it just doesn't mm-hmm. work that way. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, that's when we look at the evidence, right? To say, right. well, nobody's really doing this long term. Right. Nobody's really keeping the weight off. And when you throw in an eating disorder, that really complicates it even more. It does complicate it. It does. And one of the things that I'm so frustrated with is I, um, I still, so I still work as a a health journalist, as a a writer. And I was writing a piece um, that I interviewed you for um, about weight stigma in persons with diabetes. And, um, you know, I was asking all the clinicians that I was interviewing because the piece is aimed at people in large bodies who have diabetes. And I was asking them, well, you know, do you screen them for eating disordered behaviors? I mean, in my mind, like if someone comes in with uh, weight struggles and difficulty controlling their food intake, et cetera, you'd screen them, right? I mean, doesn't that just make sense? And Glennis, you would not believe one of the people actually said to me, oh, I don't ever see, I, I don't ever see binge eating disorder. Hmm. I don't, I've never seen it. Just the most common eating disorder that's out there. <laughs> right. And the reason that this person, I believe, has not seen it is because they have not screened for it. So I'm so pleased that you guys are talking about binge eating disorder because like you said, it really is the most common eating disorder. And I think even clinicians have this weird idea that somebody can't be functional and can't present like as a normal, living, functional person and still suffer from this. Because um, what this interviewee said to me was, oh, well, I have, you know, people sometimes describe binge behavior, but you know, they're, they're doing fine. Otherwise it's like, so am I, I'm a professional woman with, you know, like I said, a house and two healthy kids and a marriage that's thriving. And 
you know, the only thing that you could do is look at me and say, wow, you've put on some weight. But a lot of people put on weight. Nobody, I think, would assume that I have binge eating and binge eating disorder. You know, I think the other thing that I think if there was no um, other person in the room, what that provider probably is also saying in their head is, of course they binge eat. They're in a larger body. Like, duh. Right, yeah. You know, like... Right. Um, and not even equating that to, uh, to as like something really like uncontrolled and like detrimental and like the mental health consequences that go along with that. Right. Well, and that's, an, uh, that's another thing. I'm glad you brought that up because um, one of the things I think that delayed, it took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that I was binge eating again um, for a couple of reasons. One, I didn't want to believe it. I mean, come on. Didn't want to believe it. <laughs> that was a, a painful, you know, thing to accept. But two, it wasn't the same mm. as it has been. So, you know, for, for most of my life, for my teens and, and all through my 20s, the binges were very painful events in terms of the emotional aftermath, the self-hate, the depression, the, you know, all of that just like, loathing, self-flagellation and um, stuff came along with it. This time around, that stuff is not necessarily there. It's like, you know, when they describe a binge or binge eating disorder in the DSM, um, there's, um, you know, and a feeling, a feeling really bad about it afterward. And for me, I... It, that part wasn't there because I have, I had and did make so many strides in terms of self-acceptance and in terms of understanding the behavior and why I did it and why it happened. Not because I was a pig, it's not because I was a freak. It's because I had this learned behavior, most probably also hereditary behavior. And um, so... This time around, it was harder for me to come to terms with it because it didn't feel exactly the same. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And so if I had been talking to, let's say I had been going to that provider that I interviewed and told you guys about, I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have described exactly what I was doing according to the DSM because it didn't feel that way. So, I mean, that's another message that I want to get across is that like binging can look and feel different, not just between people, like among individuals, but even yourself and your own life. Um, yeah, that's yeah. a great point to, for people to hear, you know, is that it's, it might look a little different, it might feel a little different. Um, yeah, I think that's really, that's really valuable. Yeah. Sunny, you know, there's so much information here and I think we could probably talk for, for hours and we'll probably, you know, <laughs> have a, have a two parter at some point, but, um, but what would you, what have you learned from this experience? I mean, I think there's so many take homes. I'd love for you to share with our listeners. What are the salient things that you've learned about this, um, and your experience? Um, I mean, I think the first one is that dieting and actively trying to change the shape of my body does not work for me. In fact, it is actively harmful and dangerous. I think that a lot of times, I mean, I know certainly for me and probably a lot of other people, you think, oh, well, maybe I'm just a little bit special. Like I know the research says <laughs> that um, dieting is really dangerous for people with a history of eating disorders, or I know the research says 95% of dieters gain all the weight back and a lot of them plus more, but I'm the exception. To the rule. And um, I think, you know, I, I realized that that's just not true. That mm -hmm. for me, and I think for a lot of us, um, most of us, all of us, that, that restricting is simply not something that I can do. And that um, I feel grateful to have the tools and the resources to be able to feel the grief of that realization um, because it really does feel like a loss. 
and um, to move forward knowing that, okay, so if the outside of my body is not necessarily going to look or feel the way I thought it would, I can grieve that. And I can also keep living a life worth living and enjoy my life, even though that part of it isn't the way I thought it was going to be. Yeah, that's awesome. That's uh, so many great things there. And, um, you know, again, just thank you for coming on today, sharing your story, uh, being vulnerable to our audience, uh, and, you know, bringing a humanity to this uh, eating disorder that so many people are struggling with. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. You're welcome. I'm so happy to help in 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 even the smallest of ways. And um, just want to say to the listeners, like, man, I get it. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. And it's one thing for for our clients, I think, to hear it from us, but really a different thing for them to hear it from somebody who's lived through it. Yeah, definitely. I know it makes them feel less alone. And, um, you know, to hear other people basically say the way we feel through their mouth. Yes. <laughs> I, I know yes. it. I know it. It's that way yeah. for me. Well, thank you again. And we really appreciate you coming on and when you, with your cold and not feeling well, and, but also sharing this really very oh. personal story um, that's just so important. Thank you for everything that you do.